I'm Amanda. And I'm Brooke. And welcome back to another Brunch and Learn. Today we're going to be talking about one of uh, both of our favorites in our permanent collection at the Wiregrass Museum of Art, Unlikely Landing by Frank Fleming. So a little bit about Frank first. I say Frank like we're good friends, right? <laughs> but yes, a little bit about Frank Fleming. Um, he is an Alabama artist. So he is from Marion County, Alabama. Uh, one of four children, grew up on a small family farm, uh, didn't have a lot of money, but I think that simple lifestyle is what kind of sparked his love of nature and wildlife and animals. Um, so much so that when he started college, he was actually a biology major, which makes sense uh, considering his, his upbringing. Uh, but he took a couple of art classes, drawing, painting, and he had already started really playing with art and enjoying art, but it was those classes in college that um, had him change his major to, to art. So uh, as an artist, he's mostly known for his sculptures, uh, ceramic works as well, uh, and ceramic and bronze. Um, and what I find really interesting is he doesn't work from sketches. He worked from an image in his head. Uh, so again, I think a nod to that early beginnings in biology and, and just studying nature as a kid, he was really able to dig back into his memory warehouse and create from that. Um, so if you have visited the museum, Unlikely Landing is um, a very, it's a premier piece. <laughs> it's, one, it's in the entrance galleries. It's one that everyone notices. Um, and it's been in other places, but lately it's been living in, in the entrance galleries. And at first you're struck with this really elegant, beautiful heron. And I think that's the first thing that everyone notices. Very kind of posh, you know, it seems like such a fancy sculpture, but it's so typical of his work in that there's such a lot of whimsy and just kind of storytelling around it. Because once you really start paying attention, and let me go ahead and pop it up so we can take a look. Um, so here we have pulled up um, some images of the sculpture. You've got a full view and then some detail. Um, so I talked about it being whimsical and kind of quirky. Again, look at that hair and beautiful, again, elegant, but standing on a turtle, <laughs> right? Um, so whenever we have kids in, you know, they're always just, I think, just so amazed because it's such a large sculpture. Um, you don't really get a sense of the size from these photos, but it's, it's big. Um, and so they wander around and start looking. You see this catfish in its mouth. So the story I always like to tell is, you know, it's lunchtime and the heron's, you know, digging around trying to see and sees this beautiful catfish swim in the water, swoops down, grabs it, and then lands on a rock, right? And that's where the kids are like, no, no, because it's not a rock, it's a turtle. And I imagine a turtle or tortoise, right, started to move. And I feel like that's the moment that's kind of captured in this when everyone realizes that something is amiss. <laughs> um, you know, so the, the turtle's a little freaked out, the heron's freaked out, the poor fish is likely just doomed. But maybe in all of the surprise, the fish will get away. You know, you never know. Maybe there's that little glimmer of hope. <laughs> this is right before the heron goes, what? And the, the fish gets to swim away. Um, if you notice, you can see in this detail, it is a bronze sculpture, um, but the, the fish is a little different color, right? We've got a, a little bit more green there than we do in the heron, and that's due to the patina. Um, and Amanda actually has um, a story about how this whole piece originated, and I'm gonna let her take over right now. So a few years ago, I actually had the opportunity to call Frank Fleming, and I got to speak with him about the sculpture. And uh, he was very matter of fact, you know, a lot of his sculptures uh, have such a wonderful sense of humor. They are whimsical, which is really just the best word I found to describe his artwork. The, the detail is hyper realistic. Like it, it honestly looks like you just took a, these actual living creatures and cast them in bronze, but these are actually sculpted by him. And he creates a lot of works that are actually fountains. They're functional sculptures. So if you actually look closely at the mouth of the fish, and it's a little hard to see with this photo, it's better in person. So come back and see us. But the, there's like a little tiny hole um, for, the, for the fish. So the fish is you know, actually meant to be part of the fountain. And the turtle was too. Now he's he was an artist that would create fountains and was commissioned all over the place. So he had a lot of animals and creatures that would be used for these fountains. And he has a very, or he had a very large workshop. And so he had actually left over the turtle and the fish just set to the side from the studio. They were sculpted, cast, just basically massive 
paperweights just waiting to be used for something. And he had just, you know, in between his commissions of doing these large fountains or works for, you know, like the Montgomery Museum of Fine Art, they have a very beautiful functional piece in their garden out there. So, you know, a, a break from these larger projects and he thought, huh, well, what, what can I do with this? So it really just came to him that he was like, you know what, I can, I can sculpt a bird, a heron, to interact with these two pieces in an unlikely way. And so that was the start of this artwork. It wasn't this long, thought out, drawn process. It was just passing, maybe he stubbed his toe on the turtle, I don't know. <laughs> his artworks in his studio and he just had the thought, oh, I can put these together by doing this. And another really wonderful thing that you can actually see when you're in person is the bottom half of the beak, it's a little bit bent. And that's because it, as much as you can when you're sculpting in wax or clay, which is the initial start of this process, is that it's not going to fit the fish perfectly. You have to be able to get it to attach. And since all three of these pieces are attached and they're soldered and you move them as one, we don't take anything apart and put it back. It's all one massive thing. You have to make sure that, that fish isn't going to drop out of the bird's mouth and hit you on the head. So we do not want that to happen, and he certainly didn't want it to happen. So what he did is that after the bird was finished and it was cast in bronze and he got it back, he heated up the bottom of the beak so he could shove that fish into the beak and then solder it. So if you look closely on the feet that are on the, the turtle shell, and then if you look at the beak with the catfish, you're going to actually see those solder lines on the sculpture, which shows how everything is attached together. Yeah, it, it really is one of my favorite pieces to talk about. Um, I think our docents all love this piece too. And I just challenge you when you're able to come visit us in person again, really spend some time looking at the detail because it is incredible. Um, there's such personality in all three of the characters in this story, um, you know, with the heron and the catfish and the, the turtle, you know, um, they really do seem like they could come to life at any moment. And that's, I think, one of my favorite things about it. So love it. Um, and now Amanda is going to take us through a project inspired by this piece. So take it away. All right. So we're here. I have my camera set up. Um, so I can show you some different things. So here is a pop-up food chain. And because what you're seeing with Frank Fleming's Unlikely Landing is a food chain. We have the heron getting its dinner, which is the catfish. And the turtle is just along for the ride, so to speak. So what we have here is that I have uh, a bear, a bass, and then a minnow, which, you know, this eats that and that eats that. So it goes down and we have the food chain. Now in making your own food chain, you don't have to do three creatures. You can just do two. And I'm gonna show you how you can do um, a pop-up version really quickly. So we have just a piece of paper here. All you have to do is fold it in half, just like this. And then you have two sides of the paper. So we have basically a V. So you wanna make sure that you have the bottom of that V facing you, and then you want to create your tab. So we want at least one thing to pop up, and let's say that'll be our predator. And then a little bit closer to us, we wanna have our prey. So we're gonna have these lines go longer, and these will be tabs. So don't draw it as a closed off shape. We don't wanna cut anything out. We just wanna cut along those lines and stop. So this will be farther in the background and this will be closer to the viewer. And I'll show you what I mean in just a moment. So then you're gonna grab your scissors. You're gonna cut and stop, cut and stop, cut and stop, cut and stop. So now you have two tabs. Now the easiest way to do the next step is actually if you do a pre-crease. So fold it forward, crease it down, and then fold it back, all right? Now, hopefully my camera angle will work with me. So when you have it open, then you're gonna brace it, let me get a better grip of it, and you're just gonna push that through. Close now. Same thing with it down there. You're just gonna push that through and then fold it closed. And guess what, friends? We've got a pop-up, all right? Pop -up. You can see how it opens and closes with 
with that piece of paper. And um, you would be able to play, so you can see here on the paper, I think it comes through okay, where, oh, I'm frozen, where the, this one that we made that was shorter is farther back on the page, and then this one's closer. So it's like, it's like with the bear kind of creeping in the background looking at its dinner, it's farther back than the other fish. All right. Now, one important thing, you wanna make sure that when you're gluing things down, and I'm just gonna show you with a post-it so we don't take too much of your time, is that you only glue it down on the very front. So let me draw that really quick. So you only wanna draw, um, sorry, you only wanna glue, I'll get there, <laughs> right here in these spaces. You just wanna glue on the front. If you get any glue on the top or the sides, go ahead and wipe that up because it'll, like when you close it, you're gonna glue it shut and you will have to rip it to open it back up. So we don't want that to happen because whatever you attach here is gonna go just right there and then it will close and open with your, with your card here. So you'll be able to have that pop up through chain. All right, so with this, um, again, just watch your glue level. If it seeps out, like once you close it, just open it back up and wipe it. I do recommend that you do color your background and your foreground. And with this project, it's gonna be like it's sitting like this in front of you. So then I had it on my other project where this was the water and this was the sky. And then your predator and prey, when you draw those, you can truly draw them on any piece of paper. If you cut down a larger piece of paper, then you can have half of it to be used to draw your different elements to include on there. Sorry, that's a cat hair. So, <laughs> it's everywhere. So with this, you know, I did like all of these here were drawn on like one piece of paper and then my background's on the other. And you can see here that the tab is actually included in the background of these fish, but if you just paint it to match your water, it still works. You can also paint this to match your sky, however it's gonna work for you um, in creating your tabs. So as always, we really hope that you will share whatever you create with us, and we're so grateful that you all were able to join us for today's brunch and learn, and we hope that you guys will enjoy the rest of your week. Have a great weekend. Bye.